Hi, I'm Sharon Hales. I'm standing at the historic Le Mes Neiger barn at Duke Nagin Wilderness Park in northern Glendale, which is actually the La Crescenta portion of Glendale. Hikers and um, visitors come to this park to enjoy the trails, the spectacular views, and the picnic grounds, but they're often very puzzled by this imposing, beautiful barn that's behind me. And so I uh, invited local expert Mark Sturdivant to join us today to fill us in on the details. Mark is a renowned um, activist in preserving open space in Southern California and he has fallen in love with Duke Majin Wilderness Park and so I'm very grateful that you're here Mark today Thank and you. I know you have a lot of great information to share with us so tell us first of all how in the world you pronounce this place and why are you an expert? <laughs> well, first of all, I don't really think I'm an expert, but uh, as far as the pronunciation goes, there's kind of two schools of thought on that. Um, there are those that pronounce the S and those that don't pronounce the S. Now, I was taught La Messe so I pronounce the S. And why are you an expert here? How are you affiliated with this p facility? I went to work for the city in 2007. Glendale City. Yeah, for yeah. the city of Glendale's Community Services and Parks Department. And in 2011, I was put in charge of the department's trails and open space program. Okay, so Mark, tell us about the history of the family and why there's a vineyard here. Well, it all started with uh, George Le Messager, who at the age of 16 left France, which was his home, traveled to New York and then to California, arriving here um, in 1866. Uh, he dabbled in a lot of things. Uh, he uh, opened a uh, market in Los Angeles, he uh, herded some sheep up and around, uh, but he really got going when he started investing in real estate. And he began to buy up lots of property, including about 1,300 acres up here, where he envisioned growing grapes. The grape industry was thriving in the late 19th century, and he wanted to be part of that industry. So he uh, purchased property here and began to grow grapes. Uh, when World War II broke, I'm sorry, World War I broke out in 1914, he left California and went back to France at the age of 64 to fight uh, for his homeland. And his son, Louis, began work on the stone barn that's behind us here. We're not sure how long it took him to build the barn. We know that there was construction activity going on in the park for about four years. But uh, once the barn was built then, it became the center of the uh, grape growing and wine making operations. The wine wasn't actually made here, but the grapes were grown mm -hmm. here and the wine was stored here and then transferred down to downtown Los Angeles where the Le Messagers had their winery. Wow, okay, so the vineyard that we're looking at here, this wasn't actually part of their vineyard. This is more of a souvenir, is that right? <laughs> yes, this was put here um, after the park was opened by the city uh, to just um, provide people with a reminder of this was a kind of activity that took place uh, in this park way back in the day. So, Mark, was the wine industry profitable for the Le Messager family? <laughs> Yes, so far as we know, it was. They began their winemaking operation in 1911, and it ran until 1920, and the only reason it stopped was that was the introduction of Prohibition. Okay. So between 1920 and 1933, they grew grapes, but it was mostly for, like, table grapes, grape juice, that kind of thing. They weren't making any wine. Well, I'm surprised because during Prohibition, a lot of liquor <laughs> manufacturers did pretty well, but maybe that was the moonshine folks. Maybe. I, re I don't really know, and I... I've never read anything about the Le Messagers kind of uh, sneaking around during Got Prohibition it. to Got make it. wine. They did start it up again in 1933 when Prohibition was repealed. Mm. Uh, although, from what I can learn, they weren't making wine themselves at that point. They were leasing the vineyards to other winemakers and other winemakers were using the Le Messager grapes to make their wine. So they were a law-abiding winemaker <laughs> then, apparently. Well, at least that's what the record reflects. Okay, well just before we go in, tell us quickly how the city of Glendale procured this structure. Sure. Um, as we'll probably talk about when we get inside, the, the Messager family moved into the barn in 1937 and they lived there until 1960. In 1968, uh, it was sold, the barn and all the property surrounding it, was sold to a developer named William Bliss who wanted to uh, build a housing development here. And this caused uh, a lot of uh, concern and outrage on the part of local residents as these housing developments sometimes do. And so the city got involved, they took an option on the property in 1986, and three years later they opened it as Duke Majin Wilderness Park. 
Well, they opened the park, but they didn't open the barn. It hasn't been open to the public. Is that's that right? That's true, and it's still not open but to the public. But you're going to let us in, right? I'm going to let you know okay. the big secret. Okay, that's what we want to know. Let's go on inside. Okay, we're inside the barn, and we want to know more about the family history, Mark, because I hear that the family lived on the upper portion of this barn for a little while. That is correct, more than a little while, actually. Um, the barn stood until 1933. In November of 1933, there was a big fire that roared through here and uh, destroyed the, all the property around here and, and substantially destroyed the barn. The roof was, was rebuilt, but not before the big floods that happened in La Crescenta mm -hmm. on New Year's Day in 1934. Mm -hmm. So uh, that also damaged the barn as well as all of that debris came flowing down from the canyons and into the valley. Um, later, the, the roof, as I said, was, was rebuilt. It went from a kind of a peaked style roof to the arched style roof that we have now. Mm -hmm. And in 1937, um, the family of George Lemestre's son, Louis, and Lewis himself moved into the barn. And that's the first time that anyone had ever lived in the barn. And where they lived was on a mezzanine that was up here. And uh, as you can see, there's some doorways up there that lead to outside staircases and even a couple of fireplaces. But this is where they actually lived. Prior to that, the barn was used for storing grapes, for storing equipment, um, and, and even sometimes for livestock. But from 1937 to 1960, the Le Messager family lived here in the barn. So tell me about the interior, what it's going to be, and then also how the barn will be used by the public. Sure. Um, so the, the long-time goal was as a nature education center, and that's what we're, where we're still headed. Uh, so in here will be exhibits and displays, all designed to help people understand their connections with the land, with the barn, with this barn's history. So basically it will look at the human and natural history of this region, including the Crescenta Valley. So what's the time frame on all of this? We're, we're working with the consultants now, and we think it will be probably a year and a half by the time we so go 2019, through the 2019, 2020. Correct. Okay, got it. A few feet away from the barn is where the hikers pick up the trail to some excellent hiking through the Duke Majin Wilderness Park. And they might not know the story of this oak tree that's behind us. Now, in 2009, the station fire ravaged the park. And Mark, tell us how the fire impacted this land. The fire here in the park was actually a tactical burn that was ordered by, I think it was the LA County Fire Department. Mm. Um, this was several days into the fire, and the fire had moved up to the top of the ridge line that you see here. You can see where the towers are up there. So the decision was made to set a tactical burn, and just up from where we are right now is where they set that burn. And the original plan was to burn every stick, every plant, everything that, that the fire would take with it. And the assistant um, city manager, a fellow by the name of Bob McFall, just had an outburst. And he, said, he literally told me he started to cry. And he said, you can't do that. You can't do that. At the very least, you have to protect that big heritage oak tree that's there. And the city manager turned to the city's fire chief. And he said, chief, is there any way we can save that oak tree? And the uh, Chief said, well, you know, my guys have been watching a lot of things burn lately. They'd really like to save something. And so that's how that tree was saved. It's the only tree in the park that didn't have some burn damage. And today we call it the McFall Oak. The McFall Oak. And that was here when the family was here in the barn. It's seen it yeah, all. That has seen it all. It's been here even before the family was here, I'm sure. Well, behind us is where the family's vineyard actually was. So tell us how many acres they had, what was up here? Well, the total acreage that the Le Mesnagers owned was like 1,300 acres. It was bigger than the park itself. The park is 709 acres. But obviously, they weren't growing ga uh, grapes up on these high slopes here. Mm -hmm. Where they were growing the gra grapes was down along Dunsmore Canyon in these lower areas. Mm. And we have found on hikes back up into the canyon uh, grapes growing to this day. We're not sure whether um, they might have been seeds taken from our little vineyard down below and carried up by a bird and started that way. Although there are some people with good knowledge of wine who say, no, no, those are some of the uh, original Le Mesnage vines that are up there. Well, that's one more interesting thing for the hikers to look for if they happen <laughs> to see some remnants of vineyard. It's go. some heritage uh, trail finds for you. <laughs>
Well, here in the amphitheater, there are some really fabulous outdoor programs, educational experiences for the whole family. All ages enjoy it. And Mark is going to tell us what sorts of offerings are here at the park. Sure. Um, here at Dick Majin, it's kind of the, the centerpiece for trails and open space programs for the city of Glendale. And we do, we do a program almost every Saturday. Um, the first Saturday of the month is generally an interpretive program of some type. It could be an interpretive hike. We recently did one on medicinal plants. Uh, we did one uh, just last Saturday on snakes, lizards, and amphibians. And we go up into the park and look for snakes, lizards, and amphibians. And on, on that particular hike, found six of them, including two rattlesnakes. So there you did go. Did you pet them? Was, <laughs> it a, was it a petting experience? It was not a petting okay, experience. Okay, good, good. Um, uh, so we do uh, interpretive programs, we do restoration days, we have two of those, uh, one at the Glendale Narrows River Walk on the LA River. A lot of people don't realize that Glendale has about a mile of frontage on the LA River, all of which is being devoted to recreation, and so uh, we do work days there. And we do work days here at Duke Majin, where we water the trees that we planted after the station fire, and we remove invasive species from the parks. Over the summer, we do campfire programs. They're held here, wow. in, the amp amphi <laughs> here in the amphitheater. Um, and we also implemented a new Friday night lecture series, which is mostly for adults. It's That's a huge array. I'm just surprised. I think most people don't really know what's offered up here. Well, uh, i tell you what. Um, they could do a couple things to, to learn more about it. If they go to the Parks Department's uh, home page on the City of Glendale's website, there's always information to be found there. Or probably the best way is to email us at trail open space, that's all one word, trail open space, at glendaleca.gov. And we'll put you on our email list. We'll uh, send you an email about once a week. And we'll let you know about all the programs that are coming up. Another great place to look is the um, Glendale Parks and Open Space Foundation's website. Um, they have information about our programs. And it's important to remember that they uh, sponsor a lot of our programs. It's kind of a 50-50 deal between the City of Glendale and the Parks Foundation. So, so um, we like to give a shout out to the Parks Foundation because they are really, uh, they have really been in instrumental in making the Trails and Open Space program in the city a success. Well, thank you, Glendale Parks and Open Space <laughs> Foundation. I have learned so much today and I'm so grateful that we have um, organizations that preserve this wonderful facility for us. And I know the next time I come to Duke Majin Wilderness Park, I am going to know and appreciate a lot more about it. Thank you, Mark, for being with us today. We're so grateful that you came. My pleasure. To see other Foothills Finds videos or to contact me, please go to SharonHales.com and I'll see you next time on Foothills Finds. Thanks for joining us.